Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's spring webinar session, What's in a Name? Scholarly Research Profiles. Uh, I'm Glenn J. Benedict. I am the Access Services Librarian, and I'll be handling the chat and behind-the-scenes logistics today. Today's webinar is going to be presented by my Kathy, colleague, Kathy Meals. As a reminder, at the end of the session, we will have time for Q&A, both recorded and unrecorded, and the recording of this event will be sent to everyone who registered uh, probably by early next week, along with uh, it being posted to our YouTube page. So thank you for joining us. And Kathy, please take it away. All right. Thank you, Glenn. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to What's in a Name? Scholarly Research Profiles. Um, this webinar is part of our spring webinar series on research funding and publication. Um, as Glenn said, my name is Kathy Meals. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am the Reference and Assessment Librarian at the UDC Library. I'll be presenting today's session. This webinar will cover two intertwined issues, um, scholarly profiles and researcher identifiers. We'll discuss what these are, uh, why we should use them, what options there are for them, and factors to consider in deciding which one or ones to establish. At the end, we'll have time for discussion and questions. And as Glenn said, the session will be recorded, and the recording will be on the UDC Library YouTube page, and we'll have time for both recorded and unrecorded Q&A at the end. <clears throat> So let's start off with some definitions. Um, first, scholarly profiles. Scholarly profiles are a page on an online platform where you can share a variety of information about your scholarly work. Uh, the type of information you can share depends on the particular platform in question, but can include uh, such things as your scholarly output, like journal articles, books, or conference presentations, or your involvement and affiliations with organizations or institutions. There are many, many platforms for profiles, and we'll talk about some of them later. Second, we have a related concept, uh, the researcher identifier. Most scholarly profile platforms offer one of two types of identifiers, a unique identifier or a persistent identifier. Unique identifier is, as the name suggests, uh, one code, number, or other string that is uniquely tied to one thing or person. So one example is a social security number. Everyone's social security number is associated only with them. Um, some scholarly profile platforms assign a researcher a unique identifier in order to identify a specific researcher for the purposes of that platform. Persistent identifiers are machine readable or digital references to specific objects, people, or institutions. One example is a DOI or digital object identifier for an object. Persistent identifiers uniquely identify the specific object or entity, and they're considered persistent because they will always point to the object or entity, regardless of whether they have moved to another location. Uh, a particular service, for example, a scholarly profile website, uh, provides the resolution to the current and correct location of the thing and has committed to doing that in perpetuity. So why should we care about profiles and identifiers? So let's start with scholarly profiles. There are many reasons. So first, you can share more than just your publications. Uh, depending on the platform, you can highlight your publications as well as all the other myriad aspects of your work as a scholar, including the awards or the funding you've received, your work as a peer reviewer or journal editor, uh, leadership positions, or other service to the profession. And a scholarly profile puts all of that scholarly output, service, and activities in one place. This can be helpful for you, for your own records, or your tenure and promotion portfolios. Profiles can contribute to the visibility of your scholarly work and help you build a public profile. They're a means for you to share and for others to discover you and your scholarship. And they also offer opportunities for you to find others working in the field, supporting your opportunities to network or identify potential research collaborators. Scholarly profiles can save you time. Uh, many funders and publishers can integrate with scholarly profile platforms, meaning that you can submit your scholarly profile and then not have to fill in your information from scratch time and time again every time you apply for a new grant or submit a new manuscript. 
And in addition, scholarly profiles and specifically ORCID, which we'll talk about in a minute, are increasingly required by funders and publishers. And lastly, some profile platforms incorporate bibliometrics that uh, provide a measurement of author impact, helping you understand the impact of your work. Now, identifiers, why do these matter? Uh, accounting for name changes or a version of a name. Um, it's not uncommon to have a scholar attributed under variations of their names. For example, first and last name, first name, middle initial and last name, first and middle initials and last name, and so on. Or for any number of reasons, a scholar might change their name. A unique or persistent identifier addresses the problem of trying to figure out whether variations of names or changed names are the same person and ensures that a scholar gets attribution for all of their work. Disambiguating scholars with the same name. Some of us are the only ones with our names, but many or most of us aren't. Uh, a unique or persistent identifier uh, makes sure that we can tell one Jane Doe from another Jane Doe. And for persistent identifiers, the persistence itself is the most important part. We can see the advantage of the persistent aspect of persistent identifiers really clearly with URLs. Um, URLs are an example of a unique identifier. No other website has the same URL as any particular website. If you've ever encountered a broken link because a website has moved or shut down, um, you've come across the persistent identifier's reason for being, though. No. Uh, a persistent identifier is a standing, perpetual, unchanging identifier reference and pointer to you and your scholarly work. So now that we know what scholarly profiles and identifiers are and their benefits, let's talk about some scholarly profile platforms. Many profiles use unique or persistent identifiers. And this is an exhaustive list, um, but we'll discuss some, some of the most common four, four of the common ones. Uh, ORCID, Web of Science Researcher Profile, Scopus Author ID, and Google Scholar Profiles. So ORCID, uh, as we've got here, uh, ORCID stands for Open Researcher and Contributor Identifier. It's one of the best known, if not the best known scholarly profile platforms. And there's some indications that it's on its way to becoming a standard. Uh, ORCID is a nonprofit that provides persistent identifier, that permanent pointer to you as a scholar. And when you set up your profile, or as they refer to it, your record, you can list your publications, funding, awards, service, education, employment history, and biography. Um, essentially, it's an online dynamic CV. Um, you can also add keywords to describe you and your work and set privacy controls on different sections of your record. It's also possible if you choose to have certain publishers, funders, or other organizations auto-update your record with new information so you don't have to. And funders and publishers, for example, NIH, IEEE, um, are increasingly requiring submission of ORCID IDs with applications or manuscripts. Uh, next, Web of Science Researcher Profile. Uh, the Citation Index Database Web of Science offers a unique identifier, not a persistent identifier for researchers. Um, of course, as a unique ID, it does disambiguate researchers with the same or similar names and, ad and addresses the issue of multiple names for a given researcher. You can create a public researcher profile by registering on the Web of Science site. That is free to do. Um, there are extra features included with a Web of Science subscription, which UDC does not have currently. Once you have a researcher profile, you can populate your profile with your institutional affiliations, publications, and peer review activities, and also claim your author record in Web of Science if you already have one. An author record is an algorithm-generated listing of publications by a particular researcher that are already indexed in Web of Science. Of course, though, uh, the algorithms are not 100% perfect, so if you claim your record, you can verify that the information in it is accurate. Since Web of Science is a citation database, the researcher profiles also show bibliometrics that are available in Web of Science, including number of times cited, citing articles, and H index. And you can sync a Web of Science researcher profile with an ORCID record. Scopus, uh, Scopus Author ID. Scopus um, is another citation index database like Web of Science. 
And it also offers a unique identifier, again, not a persistent identifier uh, for researchers. And like Web of Science, um, an algorithm generates author profiles, uh, including name, variations on names, institutional affiliation, research subject areas, and publications for publications that are already indexed in Scopus. Author ID pages include bibliometrics like citation count and age index. But unlike Web of Science, <clears throat> you can't register and set up a profile yourself. Rather, you can request corrections, additions, deletions, and et cetera, um, to your existing profile if you have one, and request a merge of profiles if you find that you have multiple profiles based on what the algorithm has produced. So the researcher has less control here. You can import information from a Scopus author ID into ORCID, but Scopus and ORCID don't automatically sync. <clears throat> Google Scholar Profiles. Um, Google Scholar Profiles offer a profile that can include your publications and citation metrics. Google doesn't offer a unique or a persistent identifier. Um, rather, the profile is tied to a Google account, um, preferably a personal one, in case the profile holder changes institutions. Um, but Google will also require a current institution email to verify that institutional association. Um, these pro profiles don't include funding, service, awards, and so forth, but you can add keywords describing your work, which can help you find others doing similar work and help others doing similar work find you. And they do include a variety of citation metrics, such as citation counts, h-index, and Google Scholar's own i10 index. Um, plus, you can receive alerts when a newly added article um, cites your work. Uh, something to note about the citation counts here is that they are based on what is indexed in Google Scholar, um, which isn't necessarily the entire universe of scholarship, so the counts might not match um, or might be lower than what you see in other services. Um, Google Scholar profiles can be updated either automatically when your new publications are added to Google Scholar or manually. Um, you can also export your list of Google Scholar profiles into your ORCID record if you have one. There are two big strengths of Google Scholar profiles. First, if you have a public profile, you can show up in Google search results. And second, Google Scholar is really popular and widely used, and that can improve your visibility and discoverability. Um, I want to briefly touch on social networking sites since they are related to scholarly profiles. Um, first, academia.edu. So academia.edu, uh, despite what the .edu suffix suggests, that's uh, an issue for another time maybe, um, is a uh, for-profit company that provides a website where researchers can upload their publications, list their research interests, follow um, and network with other scholars, and search and find publications. Uh, it's a very popular website, which can help your visibility, discoverability, and networking. However, uh, there are several downsides. And as a for-profit company, uh, academia.edu is primarily intended to monetize user data. Um, its publication, Academia Letters, um, is criticized for having low review standards, kind of just existing so that people can get published quickly. And researchers uploading publications must might run afoul of the rights agreements with their publishers, um, depending on their author rights. And ResearchGate. Um, ResearchGate is another for-profit networking company. Um, it's similar to academia.edu in that it offers profiles, searching and finding publications, and following and networking opportunities. Um, in addition to those features, ResearchGate has a Q&A session for asking and answering questions about research. Um, the downsides here are essentially the same as uh, those for academia.edu. ResearchGate is monetizing your data, um, using it for marketing partnerships, and researchers have to be careful about whether they have the author rights to share their publications to the platform. <clears throat> so with all of these options for scholarly profiles, which one should you choose? Uh, here are some factors to consider. First is what you want out of a profile. Um, are you mostly looking to share your published work? Are you looking for something CV-like, including service work and other scholarly activities? Um, do you want your profile to include bibliometrics? Uh, whether the identifier is persistent or not. So ORCID offers a persistent identifier, uh, while other platforms offer a unique ID for that platform or no unique ID at all. 
how important is the persistence of an identifier to you? The requirements of funders or publications. Uh, a funder or publisher that you're working with or planning to submit materials to may require a profile. As I mentioned earlier, that's increasingly the case. Um, and if something is required, it's typically an ORCID ID. Your discipline. Um, in addition to the options we've discussed here, uh, there are also a variety of discipline specific profile sites to consider. Uh, a few examples are the Modern Languages, Language Associations, MLA Commons, NIH's My Bibliography, and SciNCV. The visibility and the number of users. Um, are the profiles public or only available to registered users? How widely used is the platform? And then lastly, the interoperability or ability to sync. Um, with so many platforms available, you might consider what which services can connect or sync with each other or with outside institutions or publishers. Uh, one of the benefits of scholarly profiles is being able to put your information in one place and not have to update information everywhere all the time. But there are many platforms available and it could be worth considering one that interacts well with others. So that is it for our formal, formal presentation today. Uh, we can move to Q&A or discussion if there are any questions. All right, thank you, Kathy. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to either pop them in the chat or unmute yourself and we'll have time for unrecorded questions at the end. Uh, while I wait to see if any questions come in, uh, there will be a feedback form in the chat. Um, not seeing any questions right now. Um, I think I do have one, uh, which is what makes the Orcus ID persistent as opposed to the uh, unique IDs that you're getting for the other platforms? Sorry, I was muted there for a second. Um, it's basically the, the commitment of Orcid to identify those persisters or do those persistent identifiers perpetually, right? So they've kind of continue, you know, committed to doing this till whenever. Um, whereas, you know, Web of Science, Scopus, those are companies that, you know, God forbid, could shut down at any moment, right? And they offer a unique identifier, but the unique identifier could also disappear at any time. Whereas Orchid has uh, publicly committed to um, ensuring that those resolve to the right place um, perpetually. Okay. All right. I'm not seeing any other uh, questions come in, so I'm going to stop recording. Um, again, thank you for attending, and a uh, copy will be sent and will be uploaded to our YouTube page. So I'm going to stop recording now.